been raising more since 1991. And uh, the problem I would run into, and I think I've heard this already from this group right for here, is what do I do with my bull calves or my steer calves? I'm tired of feeding them. You know, we're we gonna sell them as ropers. What we're we gonna do? Jim Rombeck, he's the better half of this group. <laughs> but anyway, we just got started. But uh, like I said, Jim is gonna speak to the, the, the side of it where we have a packing house that's USDA inspected and are able to, to market these items like that you have. And, uh, and listen, this is, this is a really informal meeting. Stop me whenever you want to, or Jim, and, and ask questions. If you got something on your mind, if you're like me, you better ask it right then, or you'll be forgotten. But uh, <clears throat> I started selling Longhorn beef before, um, before diets and, uh, and, and the health conscious people uh, were into this thing. So I, I had a little bit of a challenge in the beginning. Uh, people said, would jump around with me and say, you're selling that Jersey meat or, you know, Longhorn meat, you know, they were, they were kind of making fun of it. And I'll just tell you how I began. Is I fed out a steer, and you can feed bulls or steers, and, and I'll tell you the, the pros and cons of both of those. Um, I fed out a steer, killed it, and I made little packages little gift packages. I'm from a little town of about 3,500 people, so word of mouth works good for us. So I made these little gift packages and I passed them out to my, uh, the guys that were uh, uh, some dentists and doctors, uh, lawyers, anybody I thought might be interested in eating more healthy. And that's how I began marketing mine, and that's what I, I've done. I did no other advertising other than that. The way I start out on my beef is I, I want to grow them just as cheap as I can, just as inexpensive as I can, so I grow them on grass. And I try to get them to about 750 pounds and before I put them into the feedlot. And this, you know, we're all in this for the profit. And I'm, in a few minutes, I'm, I wish I had a, a board where I could, I could um, show you just how I figured this, but we are, you know, we're in this for a profit. How, how many of you have sold ropers? Give me, throw me some prices out here on ropers. 350. 350, all right. Anybody sold them higher than that? About 300 for us. 300 bucks? Two, I've, sold them, I've sold them from 250 to 400, you know what I'm saying? And can you pay for, a, and I know you guys in Texas can't, not with the drought y'all been in, but can you pay for hay? Can you even take care of that mama cow for 250 to 400 bucks? No, we can't. No, and I can't either. So I, th I hope today here that we can show you how you can take what I heard you say is what we're going to do with these, you know, I'm tired of feeding them, how we can turn this into a profit. A profit. I mean, this can be a really good profit. For me, I've got about 25 mama cows, and I pay for every bit of my expense selling beef. Beef pays for everything. I mean, fertilize, pay, everything. And and then if I sell a cow, then I can kind of consider that as a profit. But uh, again, back to the steers. Uh, how many of y'all? Have, have had long horn. How many of y'all have fed out your own, killed them? Okay, good deal. All right. How many are feeding them out on grass, and how many are actually grain feeding them? We grain feed. Grain feed them. Okay. All right. I have a combination. Do you? Mm -hmm. um, I grain feed. I grain feed. I know there's a market out there that they say for the grass fed, but I grew up in a stockyard uh, environment. My dad is part owner in the stockyard, and I tell you how, how we got our beef. If, uh, if they were loading out a truck and, and a steer broke his leg, we took him to the butcher pen, and that was beef for the next six months. <laughs> so it was grass-fed beef. So uh, I, I want the, the grain-fed beef. Um, get back to uh, how I began on mine. 
I've been doing this for about 15 years, and I've got it figured out about what fits my customer, kind of the price that they can stand, and how long it takes them to eat like a, a half a bit. I sell more halves. I hardly ever sell a whole. I sell 10 times more halves than I do even quarters. But in my market, you have a family uh, that has two kids, and they're, they've got softball on Monday nights, and Tuesday nights they've got something else, church on Wednesday night. But anyway, it takes my customers about six to eight months to eat a half a beef. So I've kind of tailored my, my beef to fit my market. I like to start them out at about 750 pounds. I got three in the in the fattening pen right now. I weighed them before I started. They average 720. I like to be at 750, and I'll tell you why in, in just a minute. Uh, I feed mine from 90 to 120 days, and really, really, you ought to go 90 days uh, to get the grain in them and everything. But when you start seeing them, when they start getting fat around the tail head, y'all know what I'm talking about when you say they're finished. You know, you can look at them in their brisket, around their tail head, down their back line, or top line, down their back, and you can tell when they're finished. And not all of them finish at the same time. So, uh, so you want to, like I said, feed them from 90 to 120 days. I want my steers to top out at about 1,050 pounds. And in my situation, mine are going to, uh, they're going to dress out about 57%. Y'all know what I mean when I say 57%? I mean, when they snatch the hide off and, and everything and they're hot hanging weight, they're going to be, if they went in at 750 and come out at 1,050, that's going to bring you about 600 pounds of meat. That's 57% uh, dress weight. <clears throat> that that puts my average at about three pounds to three and a half pounds a day. Has anybody got any numbers that they kept up with it maybe that you fed out beef and that's what that's, that's what otters have been running, but about like course. I don't wait till they're seven fifty. I when they when we wean them, we precondition them mm -hmm. and we go straight to the lot with them. Really? And those caves, we're killing those, we're harvesting those caves at that 750. Oh, are you? And, the, and okay. the customer seems like it's younger, it's tender. I mean, in our case, uh, and all Ellen and I have done so far is just sell the hamburger, uh, ground beef, and the taste. Uh -huh. So uh, it's worked for it, and we're from a small ag town, and word of mouth, and of course being in the auction business, why we have, we have a good outlet when we have big you know, crowds at our sure. sales. Right. Uh, to market the lean beef. Do you mind me asking how much you get for them? What were what, uh, the, the last that we sold, you sold it for $3.350 three a pound. Right, okay. And that's just hamburger. Hamburger. Right. Did you say you grain fed or you just grass it? No, grain fed. We grain fed. We, we wean our caves and then we precondition them okay. and then I warm them up uh, on a growing ration about oh, 30 days. I go straight to the lot with them and uh, we, we harvest in 100 days. Okay. We have sold at $4 a pound, but we feel like we can sell more yeah. at 350 Right. You have to be careful on, on hamburger meat because yeah. you're taking the bone out of it. So you got to get more for it. I get, and I'm in the brokest part of the world that there is. These guys in California are going to laugh when I tell you what I get for mine. I get $2.35 a pound, hot hanging weight. That's, that's, I let my customer pay the, the cut and wrap it. If they want to quick freeze it, they, they pay for the quick freezing. They pay, they pay for the kill feed. I load it up and I take it. I got two butcher pins in my area and I take it whichever one they like. So and that's live weight? You're, no, you're, you're, you're talking about the hanging rail weight. weight. Exactly, hanging okay. weight. Okay. Hot hanging weight. 235 a pound. 235 a pound. And they pay all the expenses. They pay all the expenses. And, and, and that's, that's about as much as I can charge where I'm at, uh, we don't that's have a lot of industry. That's $1,200. That's, that's 1400 So I can take, I can take $250 to $400 roping steer and turn it into $1,400.
I've got three in the pen now, and, and I know exactly where they're going to top out at. I know they're going to top out, and I can, I'll be within 50 bucks of what I, my plan is. Uh, these three is going to bring me $4,200. And I try to do this twice a year. Now, this is my opinion. I like to do it in the cool weather. I just think that they grow better. They, they, they just, uh, in, the, in the heat, they just don't eat as much. Is, uh, and, and what you want to do is you want them guys to eat all they'll eat. Now, I don't have a, uh, a free choice feeder. I pour mine out. I just, I use my catch pen. I got a catch pen right there at my house, and I've got three pins in it, and, uh, and, and I've got well water tied to them, so they drink drinking well water, and I feed them in the morning, and I feed them in the evening. And on those three, uh, I'll start out and feed them about six gallons, and and then I, 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 I'm up to about nine gallons in the morning, nine gallons in the afternoon, and I'm gonna tell you the ration uh, that I use, and it, and I'd be curious to know what, how y'all feed and what, what y'all are using. And of course, your area you know, changes. I've got corn, you know, we live in a rural area, and, and corn is accessible to me, and so I use corn as my grain, and y'all may use others, and I'd like to know what you do. Do you know about how many pounds that is? I'm sorry? Do you know about how many pounds that is? You were speaking of gallons of this one. Oh, I... Uh, I can't believe it's about 30 pounds. They'll eat 20 pounds a day. Five-gallon butter is about 30 pounds. Feed them 100 days, they'll eat a ton of my ration. Okay. Um, like I said, I like the, the, the feed in the cooler months. This is just my idea. I like to stay away from December because you got Christmas there. So what I do is I have, I try to have steers that come off and I start feeding them in, I feed them in September, October, and I try to kill them right the last of November, and then uh, that way they can, they can pay me, and, uh, and then they have Christmas to spend their money on, on Christmas. Then I start back in January, and I, I took January, February, and March, kill them again. That's in my cool months, and I think they just, they, they grow off better. <clears throat> Let me back up just a minute. We don't, and I, I'm, I can say that we don't use any steroids, any antibiotics, uh, any wormer, or if you do use wormer, please read the label because some wormers stay in cattle longer than others. So just be sure. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we uh, can really uh, play up on is, is uh, to these people that are so health conscious and, and, and wanting you know to, to eat more correctly and everything is is that you know we don't have any steroids, uh, no antibiotics, no wormer. Uh, they drink well water. They, we feed them you know grain. Uh, I think that's just a, a good marketing marketing tool for us right there. Let me touch on uh, the, the laws. And Jim, when he speaks to this, when it's USDA inspected, you can basically sell it to anybody. But, uh, and I know, in, I have customers in Florida and Alabama, and I have to pre-sell it. I have to sell it before it's killed to be uh, under the law. So I have a list, and like I said, I go down that list and I call, call this, these people and I say, hey, you need any beef? They either say yes or no and just go to the next person. I probably got about between 30 and 40 names. But you got to, by the law, you have to pre-sell it. I, when I deliver it, I tell the butcher pen, Tom's getting a half, Bill's getting a half, Sue's getting a quarter, Rick's getting a quarter, and I give them the name, and that's all legal by law. Um, but you do have to have it pre-sold <clears throat> before you kill it. That's uh, as if you package it or sell it as Quarters and halves. And quarters and halves. Quarters and halves. If you sell it, uh, it's quarters and halves. You have to have it pre-sold, and, and it has to be their beef that they're that they're killing. You know, they have to take ownership of it. You know, so uh, that relieves you of any responsibility. I'm going to talk about uh, the ration that I feed. Uh, I'm lucky enough that my wife and her family owns feed, seed, and hardware, and they actually still do grinding. They they grind feed. They make feed. So what I start out with, and y'all familiar with Cargill, Neutrina, such as that, 
we start out with a 12 percent pelleted feed and my idea is that i don't want to to make a batch of feed it's going to last me about two two weeks something like that it'll get stale my goal is to keep these steers eat just as much as they'll eat. And I have just a little different, not saying that yours is wrong, but just working for you to feed them coming right off the mom, you know, and, and getting to about 750. I want to put a frame on them and get them fat on grass and and then I want to fatten them just as quick as I can. And that gives them, they'll be the faster you can get them uh, fat or fatter then you're going to add marbling and, and, and tenderness to it. Is the way I the way I see it. But um, I start with a 12% feed. <clears throat> I take 500 pounds of 12% uh, nutrient of Cargill, whatever. I take 250 pounds of corn, which corn in our area runs about 9%. So what you did, you took a 12% feed, added a 9% feed to it so you've reduced your percentage of protein there but I come back I had uh, 50 pounds of uh, cottonseed meal 50 pounds of peanut meal for the fat and then I add molasses to it for the flavor and also the cotton meats cottonseed meal really adds to the flavor as well <clears throat> and that'll make me about 900 pounds of feed and that'll last me about two weeks or two and a half or three weeks I, I don't keep up with it exactly but you know I know we have to make feed three or four times during feeding out the, those, uh, those or maybe even more than that what were the ingredients mean? pardon what were the ingredients again okay they were um, started out with 500 pounds of a 12 percent pellet yep. and then I got 250 pounds of corn that's my added grain I've got 50 pounds of cottonseed meal and 50 pounds of peanut meal and then I don't know what we add liquid molasses to it and I don't remember how much that is but that's going to make you about maybe 25 pounds of liquid molasses or, and you can use dry molasses or whatever but uh, that's going to make you about 900 pounds of, uh, of feed <clears throat> and it, to me it just stays it just stays fresher that way Did, hey does anybody have any questions I'm doing all the talking you know, when in the we show cabin in the show circuit also, and the, the big new thing that everybody's using right now is a beet pulp. Because what the beet pulp does is it stretches out their stomach. Is that something you guys have to help them? Basically, would make what it does it makes them eat more. Right. Makes them gain weight quicker, and that's it's just to show people. <coughs> really, it's a big to do right now in the show circuit is because you want your animals as fit as possible and as quick as possible. So the beet pulp is something, and it's a dry mix, but you got to mix it. Because the cattle don't like the flavor, so you got to mix it in your. Oh, really? Okay. I know that Jimmy Jones he feeds out some. Well, all of us guys in Settling, South of the Southeastern Texas Longhorn Association, most of us feed out cattle, you know, to supplement our income on this stuff. And he uses, he starts out like you said. He starts out with hay though, and for the first week or ten days, he wants to feed them hay and just and stretch that good out, you know, so they can uh, take in as much feed as possible. But thank you, Brent. That's a good point. Um, also, um, I'd like to talk about, we also do uh, the skulls, we say the skulls, and, and we've marketed some skulls, and we've got skulls all over the house, we've got hides all over the house, but uh, that's, uh, uh, that's another way to, uh, to sell skulls and hides and offset the cost you feed and make this more profitable. Um, it costs us to buy our hides back. It costs us, the market fluctuates in hides just like it does in anything else, but it's usually between $20 and $25 to buy your hides back. My wife and them sell 50 pound bags of salt. It's feed grade salt. You don't want any iodized salt. Uh, but this usually runs about $8.50 a bag. Don't be afraid. How many, how many people have done hides? No. Do not be afraid to use salt if you want your hair to stick. If you don't want it to stick, be real skimpy and you'll have <laughs> patches of hair to pull out. And, and I'll tell you this too. Uh, Mother Nature, I do my hides in the winter. And, and if you do them in the summer, they're trying to shed. If they do them in the winter, 
you got you got a good haircut right there, and it's gonna it's gonna look better, be fuller, and look nicer. So uh, uh, I like to do mine. That's, that's another reason to do mine in the, in the winter as well. Uh, so if I buy my hide back at uh, say twenty bucks, I got twenty five dollars. I, I I get a hundred feet pounds of salt. And you have to when you do your hide, uh, you have to get all the fat off of it. And, and I salt mine down. I lay it in the barn where the sun can't get to it. I put it in a cool place and, and I, I salt it down like that thick. And you have to do it, guys. You have to do it immediately. It, when that thing, when they jerk the hide off of that steer and it's still steaming, you got to go to the house and salt that thing down if you want that, high, that hair to, uh, to hold. Is it on the top or the bottom? It's the bottom. The bottom. What it does, it pulls the moisture. I put two bags on it to start with. And uh, if you try to, to take the fat off of it immediately, it just rolls around. It's hard to take off. Okay? I like mine to sit like for a day or two, but I put enough salt on it to really get that thing salted down. I don't want to see any hide anywhere. I want it to be, I want it to be a good layer of salt on that. And I don't try to trim it down either. Uh, just go ahead and salt it down. Leave it for a couple of days. Then I, I just take a, a water barrel. Dump all my salt, and you're going to have some wet salt. Just you want to discard that wet salt. You just get all your dry salt, put it into a, a like a water tub, and uh, and then go in there. And I got one of these uh, fleshing knives, and I, and I just take me a 55 gallon drum, and I lay it across that 55 gallon drum, and I can work that thing down in no time. It's like a drawing knife. You can take all the fat off of it, lay it back down, and then I take that that first that other 50 pound bag. I've already put. Uh, 100 pounds on it, as I said, about 150 pounds of salt, and I put that that 50 pound down first, and I put my salt that I've already used on it last, and I put 150 pounds on it. I leave it about a week or 10 days. Uh, I, I'll hang it up and let the, what water is in it drip out of it, and then at that time I'll trim it down because I send my hides to Sebring, Florida. That's the cheapest place that I've found, and they'll tan them. But you've just about done all the work for them, but that's, that's what I do. I, I ship them down there, and, when, and, and they'll keep them about six months and ship them back to you. And you're going to have about $30 in freight um, shipping them down there. And then they'll, they're going to cost somewhere around $100 to $125 for them to. And they'll, when you get them back, they're ready to lay down on your floor. They're so clean and soft and supple. And uh, to me, you're going to have about. Uh, Two hundred dollars, one hundred seventy-five to two hundred dollars in your hide, and you know you can you can use that for you know dressing up your house, or you can sell them, or whatever you want to do. But um, that's just another avenue right there to, to make these things more profitable. Um, how many people do skulls? Do skulls? Okay. Uh, while that skulls at the butcher pen, I get them to go ahead and skin that dude for me because I'm. If y'all ever skin a head, you can't hold on to it and skin it and put it between your legs and stand on the horns and everything else. But anyway, I let him go ahead and skin it for me. And then uh, we have a catfish pond. And I take like clothesline wire because those catfish will drag it off. And I put, uh, I put sheet metal screws on the back side of the horn so those horns won't come off. And I, I throw it out in a catfish pond and, and they clean it up. I mean, uh, They'll clean it up in about six weeks, a month, six weeks, something like that. And those horns and everything stays real soft and supple. That's just my idea. When I take it out, I pressure wash it off, and I got a lady that paints them for me. And if you paint it, you want to paint it, I mean, all up in the brain cavity, everywhere. I know it's gross, but you want to paint that thing inside and out, seal it up, and you don't have any, you can hang it on your wall in your office or whatever, and you don't have any bugs or anything like that. I mean, it just, it seals it up. And, uh, what kind of paint do you use? What kind of paint? Uh, just like, I go to these like, uh, Cinder. it's just like an off-white or bone-white uh, paint, just a little can of paint. Uh, they find it, uh, what they are oil based? I don't even know. But they it's get it. clean your brush. I don't do it. I have a lady that does it for oil there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, What's the story that sells frame? Hobby Lobby. There you go. 
we do we do the opposite. We don't paint them, but we drop them in Clorox. Mm -hmm. I put about six or seven gallons of Clorox and drop it. And what it does, it'll get them white, and then you set it out in the sun and it bleaches them. Mm -hmm. The problem about doing that though is it will make the the skull brittle compared to yours. So it's a little different way to do it. But we do fire ants. We don't do ponds. We do fire ants in Texas. Let's well, take the hide off. You don't have You don't have to take the hide off. They'll eat, they'll eat everything. And usually we'll take the whole animal out if we have one die. We have a, a place we take it. They go ahead and once they start cleaning up, then we'll take the, the skull. We have to put it in a fenced in area because raccoons and things will drag it off. And I'll tell you another way. This is gross. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, you're leaving days, your horns and it just yes. has to keep playing. Yes. With it. But you if you don't have a tub big enough, you've got to keep shifting the horns because it will no, pick up that line of the core. That's, that's hard. I, I've even boiled. <laughs> I've done it here. I had a big pot, and I'd stick that thing there and boil it. But then, around that it's nose good. area, it's makes good jump around. But I'm telling you, it makes it. Right uh, Brent said it makes that bone real good. We have a guy home that I, I feel very fortunate, and he picks them up at the floor. He's a young man, very talented, and ran into him. Anyway, he does all of what you're talking about. Paints them, puts the hangers on them. Right. Uh, they're 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 just as shiny as a new car. Beautiful, fifty bucks. Oh, oh man, that's that's reason. No, I'd rather play with a stinky old head. <laughs> <laughs> and also, <laughs> I'll, I'll, have, uh, I'll just tell you what I do uh, on the. You know, I think it's pretty neat. Uh, I have no cow named Not Dot. She was Jet Jockey daughter. Some of y'all might remember her. She's pretty famous old cow. And she died. And I uh, sent her high at all, had it tanned, brought it back. And when I did her skull, I, the part I trimmed off on the hide, I, I, the area between the horn and the skull, I wrapped that with her own hide. And uh, you can do raw hide, you can do rope, you can do whatever you want to do to kind of dress it up. But that's just one thing that we do. Kind of got off the lean beef, and I apologize, but we're all here to make a profit on these, uh, on these steers. And I think that, that the folks that are not doing lean beef, you know, some I, I hear the talk on everybody says, how do you make a profit at these cattle? How do you, you know, this is it. This is it. I think that, that this is a, a golden opportunity to, to turn this into a really profitable um, operation with your cattle just to lean beef. I mean, some people look at it as a, when they see a bull calf form, you know, but hey, I look at it as an opportunity uh, because I'm sorry. Why is it, Terry, that, that the our association instead of worrying about the horn measurements and the shows and uh, kind of a novelty type deal? Why, why is it that some of these people that's got so much money, why aren't they taking this money and promoting this longhorn beef and getting it in these stores and, and we get a kill floor and package this and promote the beef instead of? Well, he had 97 inches of horn. Uh, I, I don't understand. I think we're, we're, we're missing out on something here. Great question. Great question. And Jim, I'm not going to steal his thunder, but he's going to tell you all about this. But but that's exactly right. The meat tastes so much better. Oh, it does. It's because it's <laughs> one. Like the it's really great longhorn beef. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have people say, you know, I got to get used to that longhorn. I said, it just doesn't taste like that when you get the grocery store. I said, I'm glad, <laughs> and it doesn't. And, you know, when when your wife cooks down, makes spaghetti or something, she cooks that hum hamburger meat down, and you pour off a half a cup of grease, and you do the Longhorn, and you have don't have any. I mean, you know, well, that's you the compare difference. Compared to Angus, if you raise Angus cattle, right. it's the same thing. The hamburger meat is just so much better. Well, thank you. We raise Angus. We do too. We got an Angus herd. We got a Longhorn herd. You know what we eat? Longhorn. Herd. I have never. Eat one of the angles. Never. But uh, I'm, we beat Longhorn in my house for 15 years. Our biggest problem with people that we sell meat to, I mean, the first time, mm -hmm. and I, we always tell them, don't leave it on the grill very long because it doesn't have as much fat, and you're going to wrap at me because the patty was too dry. Right. And they said, Terry, you're exact. I mean, I said, you, it's almost you lay it on there, if your fire is right, flip it, let her settle, scoop that baby up, and put it on the bun, and I promise you it's just juicy, 
but that's only complaint as right. far as a complaint right. that, that we've had. That made me think of something else. Uh, how many of y'all feed out steers and how many feed out bull calves? Which, which one? That's what we might Steers? Okay. I, I, I don't, my question was going to be the steers versus the bulls. And, and I did it both ways, and let me just tell you my thinking on it. Bulls are going to be lean. If you got if you got a customer that wants it lean, I got people that even still throws away the fat. You know, we're going to have some fat on our longhorns, the, and, and they still skimming off and throw it away or whatever. If you got a customer like that, you want to save them a bull. Bulls are going to be leaner than the steers. But the only drawback to that is, is that my watering troughs are in my catch pen, my cattle come up there, you got a cow in heat, you got a bull right there that you're feeding out, he's just pacing the fence, pacing the fence, you know, trying to get to them and bellowing and everything, carrying on. Uh, that's the only drawback to bulls. Bulls, they may even, they may finish out a little better than a, than a steer. But you take them to the same weight? Yes. Bulls as a steer? Yes. yes. You, I, sorry, I have to, you, go ahead. Do you slaughter them in the bull, or do you? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Now I, I don't, I don't want them to have bred any cattle. You know, I don't, I don't let them breed. In, I don't let them breed for a season, bring them in, and feed them out. You know, I want to keep them uh, away from. Them. Well, if, if you end up with a bull that breaks a horn, or you decide that he's not fit to breed, are you better off to go on and castrate them later, or go on and just? If you if you let them get eighteen months old, then just I just leave them a leave bull. Leave them a bull. Yep, I'd leave them a bull, and I probably I probably drank. Have they been with cows? No. No. Okay. Just go and use that hammer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. even try to save your prime cuts or the prime cuts. No, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were heading with this that you had a bull that you had bred and something happened to him. You brought him in and wanted to do something with him. I'd do him a hamburger. If it's if it's nothing, if he's not bred to him with cattle or whatever, then now, uh, hey, I just treat him just like a steer. I could sell him. I'd sell the. I'd feed him out. Just like I would around the steer. Oh yeah. yeah. What about steak thickness? Steak thickness. What's your experience with? Them? I don't. I mean, I had people. You know, they want to get more steaks, and they cut it a half inch or three quarters inch. I think it's better like at an inch or inch and a half. Yeah. 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 Not gonna get me steaks, but I no. don't think it works out better that way. That's what you want to sell about other kind of. You know, I am. Um, how old are they when you get them to about thousand, thousand fifty pounds? They're probably in, you know, twenty months old, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jerry, we have a, a, a relative in our family uh, who works at a feedlot in Bovina, mm -hmm. and at Christmas time we, of course, get together. You know, just visit about everything. Anyway, we're talking about these long ones. He said, "You, you bring something up." He said, "Let me share something with you." that nobody talks about. He said the best set of calves that has ever come, I'm talking about far, is feed efficiency, feed conversion, no shots, no sickness, no nothing. Stick their head in the trough, do what they're supposed to do, yield grade, carcass is a set of longhorn calves. But nobody ever hears anything about that. Right, right. See what I'm saying? Yep. I mean, it's a longhorn breed in the end. I get back to this bill as an association. That stuff that needs to be picked up and on the front page of the Longhorn magazine instead of driving them down Main Street, Fort Worth. Well, like if you you talk about using them as, as what they intended for. You, yes. Well, yeah, well, you, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. I mean, because exactly. you have a feedlot man tell you that, <clears throat> and he's got the feed conversion, he's got the carcass data, and and of course, the Angus breed, we know how, how so far ahead of other breeds that they oh, yeah. are. It is amazing what they've done. Right. We, we, we test our bulls at Oklahoma Beef at Stillwater, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Just took a set Wednesday morning. But, but what, I'm, what I'm getting at, mm -hmm. these longhorn cattle will do this, but nobody knows nothing about it. Right. That's well, that's true. nobody ever. I've never read a thing about feed conversion. No. Anything no. like that. There's I think no Jim, kept there. yeah. absolutely zero. Yeah. Jim's going to talk about this, and I, I sure don't want to steal his thunder. And I, I'm going to let him speak here because I'm I've taken over half the time right here. But does anybody have any questions before I sit in and let Jim talk? I assume, Jerry, when you say <clears throat> that you have to pre-sell yours to satisfy the local laws over there, mm -hmm. 
that you're just pre-selling a on a per side basis as as opposed to per pound. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sell yes. side for X right. number of dollars. And they don't pay any till after. I mean, uh -huh. you know, uh, just as long as the as the butcher pen has has got it got it down in their name. If somebody comes along and checks them, they got a name to match up with the carcass back there, you know, in the in the freezer. But you know, I take it down there. You know, we kill it. They put their name on it. They might not pay me for a week or ten days or whatever. But my response, my responsibility is over, okay. and and it's all legal by the law. I mean, it, it's pre-sold. It's not. I don't ever feed out three, kill them. And they're hanging up down there in my name, and I'm out here trying to peddle them. You know, sell them out. They, I, pay, I guess, they pay the processor directly. They do. Yes. Let me tell you because people. I got some people that want nothing but, you know, they say, hey, we're going all the time and we got kids in ball and band and football and everything else and I just want hammers in there. Well, that, hey, they can deal, they can, I let them call up, I let them deal with the butcher pen. You might have to help them with it the first time or two and kind of give them some suggestions, but I let them guys, and, and from then on, I don't ever have to call the butcher pen now. I just give them the name at the butcher pen, who's, who's getting it? And then I, and I say, hey, they'll contact you in a day or two, and, and, and it's done. Any other questions? And they typically let it hang for two or three weeks. That's, I like to let mine week. hang three weeks. I have people let it, let it hang 10 days, two weeks, three weeks. I've had some hang it for a month. If you hang it for a month, you're going to have a little, looks like hair growing on it. You have to skin that off before you cut it up. But, that's called age beating. <laughs> Some folks like it that way. Uh, thank y'all. Uh, I hope this has helped maybe uh, some of the people that, that are in the rural areas uh, find a market to make this thing profitable. The, it, it, we have got a gold mine at our fingertips. It's just if you want to use it or not. It takes you five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the afternoon to feed these dudes. And uh, I did want to mention something. I did want to say this. I do cull what I want to feed out. Those steers that are really laid back, real gentle, easy going, that's the ones I want to feed. Uh, I did take, because uh, I don't like to deal with ropers, uh, those guys, they come by and they want to buy these two. When you save these two the next month when I get paid, or can I go ahead and take them with me and I'll, give you, I'll send you a check and that never happens, I just go ahead and take mine to the, to the market. And I took three this year out of all my calves. I had three that I didn't think was calm and gentle enough. The calmer and more gentle they are, the, the better the meat's gonna be. If you if you, you try to feed out one and he's you go in there and feed him and he's bouncing off the walls, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be as tender as I like to as I like to have my name attached to. So uh, I do call even some of my steers. Like I said, I had three. I had nine this year. I fed out six and, and took three to the market. If you take them to the market, don't, let me tell you, don't try to get them butterball fat. If, if they're going to be ropers, those are, I done found out, my buddy come with me, Clay Mitchell, he's a roper. Hey, they want those kind of scraggly, scrawny, uh, they're not real fat because they're going to take them out that afternoon and they're going to start practicing with them and roping it. They don't want that fat, real fat. So don't think that you, I'm going to take them to the stockyard, I'm going to feed them for a month before I take them because I'm going to get more money out of them. I took three to the stockyard, and this is not the way it's always been. We used to get about 50 cents a pound because uh, we sell hangings down at our local stockyard. And the, the guy on the stockyard come by and seen those three steers. He said, why don't you bring those to the market? I said, well, I don't want to take 50 cents a pound for them. And uh, he said, no, I'll tell you what, if you bring them, I'll never I guarantee you a dollar a pound. One brought 92, one brought 93, one brought 95. And, uh, you know, that's still better than selling for, for $200 road. <coughs> what would Angus be rated at that point in time? We <coughs> sold some, dollar sixty. you know. Let's say right. about 30, 40% difference. Right, right. You just run them over the scales, don't matter when, it's just, it's just about that. Big of a difference from black cattle to the long ones. If they're solid, they might. If they're solid color, mm -hmm. like oh, they're solid reds, I hardly ever get them. I never get a black one. But if I, but if they're like solid red and they don't have a lot of white on them, they'll bring a little bit more than 
you know, the, the paint there. Right. right. I mean, I don't know why it doesn't make any sense because they're all labeled on them. So. It's something that has, uh, I can't say monetarily because we didn't do it for monetary reasons, but our uh, Tillman Baptist Association has started a uh, revival for Christ in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And Ellen and I, and uh, we feed these longhorn steers and we process them. We pay for everything. We make the patties and we feed, serve those longhorn burgers at the rodeo. And in two nights, we feed 2,200 people. My <laughs> so the longhorn, the long, you know, goes with the theme of the rodeo. That's a tax donation. <laughs> uh, well, that's kind of got word out to the You see what I mean beef. about the word? Right. This longhorn beef. And we're not out there promoting. I mean, we don't have signs that says uh, break longhorns and buy your beef from us. We don't do it, not do it for that. Right, right, but right. it's a good, or we felt like it's a good tool. Instead of going to the local store and buying that crap, right. uh, we furnish the beef. Right. And it's really, you know what I mean? Right. We did that for like for benefits for somebody had cancer or something like that. Yeah. You know, they want to do a benefit and everything. They yeah. don't make me. It's just. Yeah. It's a win-win situation. Yeah, you can't, yeah. you can't have to give God. And, no, I promise you. Well, so. does do the packing houses gripe about the horns? No, I don't have any problem. But now that's, a, but now if they had to kill a hundred that day, then they might lose. You know what I'm saying? But the, the packing houses I use have got a door wider than that. You know, so yeah. where they bring them in, kill them. You know, that it's not a problem. Where I yeah, try to much in the right. Let me say this. I, I've got to let Jim talk about it. I'm on. I've already been here too long. I've got, uh, and this is the great thing about Longhorns, and you brought this out just a minute ago. I've got a friend that's in the Longhorn business, and he loves the Longhorns. So he's got kids. He's got three kids growing up. He's got one that's five, eight, and nine, or something like that. He said, I'm going to put my Longhorns on hold. I'm going to put a black bull on them, and, and I'm going to keep the, the mama cows. He said, when my kids get up and get out of ball and in school and everything, then I'll go back and put the Longhorn Bull on them and go back to going to the shows and, and you know, going to the sales and such as that. So, uh, you know, whatever you want to do with these cattle, he takes them to the stockyard. They never know it. I mean, they never know it. When you used to take them off the mama cow, they're about 400, 500 weight cattle, take them to the stockyard, he's getting the same thing that I'm getting for pretty close to the same thing we're getting for our angels. But that's... Uh, so you can do whatever you'd like to do. You know what I'm saying? Jim, come talk to these people. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you all. There weren't any more questions, right? Okay. Well, I don't know. Paul and Terry's going to be pretty tough. <laughs> he, did a, he did a good job. Um, I'm, I'm Jim Rombeck. Uh, Terry and I worked on the Lean Beef Committee. Uh, did a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of uh, in the in light of the questions you were asking. Uh, I started out um, selling it on the rail, um, and typically, if I, we didn't do that, we would buy we would buy cows at different sales, and we'd grind the whole thing, and uh, we were selling it um, three, four dollars a pound, and, and uh, up at the Kansas Nebraska border, we, we could we couldn't keep it in in on hand. We joined this, we started this committee, we did some work. <clears throat> we wanted to, uh, how, do we, how do we get somebody to start their own label? What, what kind of hoops you have to drop, uh, uh, jump through? So we did that, JBR started their own label this year. Some of the uh, products we have are, are passed around the non-perishable, and then the steaks and hot dogs, brats, all that. Uh, we, we started our own line. Uh, everybody knows that uh, the USDA recognizes Longhorn as, as a as a certified certified Longhorn meat, right? So <clears throat> that's you know the the Angus Association had that thunder for a long time. The Longhorn has it now. Uh, one of the things I don't know if everybody knows, we did a, a study and it was on grass fed, uh, which is what uh, I do. Uh, we sent the meat in and had it analyzed, and it came back the hamburger was 98 percent. Pretty good. Um, Walmart. Last time I was at Walmart, their hamburger, the leanest you could buy there was 93 percent. Um, I'm assuming it's still that way. One of the interesting things was <clears throat> that I didn't know is uh, 
the Longhorn meet was it meets the requirements for the American Heart Association. I, I don't know if there's another beef breed out there that can say that. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, it's 4,500 a product back. Oh, so 4,500 to you get your own, and then it's thousand yeah. product. Yeah. So it's for for a, a small producer like everybody in this room to say, hey, I want to. I'm going to buy that American Heart Association stamp to put on my label. It's pretty tough, but it's, it still doesn't mean we uh, we don't have the product, and uh, and it's another marketing opportunity. Um, the 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 processing, uh, finding your processor. <coughs> Terry covered a lot of that. Unless you have questions on it, um, you start your own label. You have to have uh, st start with a business plan. A real one. Write one down, and this is the direction you want to go. Get someone to help you with a label. Uh, you can create your own, but there's people that do it, do that for a living, and they don't charge very much. Make your logo, get a label, get it approved. Find a find a USDA approved plant. Take your animal to it, and you, you never have to worry about any kind of grief down the road because it's <clears throat> where Terry was selling his pre-selling it, hanging on the rail, and when, when he drops it off, technically, that was their animal. When when you take it there under your label, <clears throat> you're, you're putting your name on it. So, you know, take a good animal, take it to a good place, have a package. Uh, your business plan would have uh, a marketing plan uh, Part of that can be can be difficult depending on where you live. We did the same thing Terry did when we started. Um, we gave away a lot of samples, and uh, I'll tell you what that's the the beef. Once somebody eats it, that's the best best thing you can do. Um, you, you have repeat uh, customers almost right off the bat. Um, one of the <clears throat> one of the advantages. Uh, Terry talked about was selling the hides, skulls, whatever. <coughs> One of the first bills we had at this new processor, um, they charged me uh, so much to dispose of uh, organs. And uh, by law, they could charge me up to, to 30 pounds per steer. And uh, we got, we did a little investigating. And I think you have the pet treat somebody does back there. That, that's, what, that's what they're made out of. They, they take the organs and uh, and what what we're going to throw away and they add add to it but what everybody uh, including JBR was thrown away before then is, is something you can market we uh, Terry and I was talking yesterday <clears throat> we haven't found a way to market the hooves or the moo but the rest of them we've got we've got in the packing somewhere and well one thing uh, one the last thing that my wife come up with was uh, the bones, dog bones, we, we smoke them. Um, and uh, if, you, if you go to the, you, you go about anywhere, people, people pay a lot of money for their dogs, for pets. The, those pet treats, dog bones, you know, you can find somewhere, uh, you, you can market them yourself, give them away. Uh, it's, it's just another opportunity. Back, back to the beef. Um, we, we do, uh, because, because we market ours as certified Longhorn, we have an affidavit that says that, that JBR, well, when we take this animal locker, we had to sign, we had to provide one that they know that we're selling uh, registered or certified Longhorn beef. We also do one, and then this is up to us, and this is an opportunity the association has, uh, especially the people in this room, is uh, you have an affidavit that states that, that it is uh, antibiotic and steroid free. And then again, if, if we, as a, as a, a meat producing group, I'm association. Gonna, I'm gonna pass that around. Okay. So this is it right here. Y'all can look at it. And you get a blank one, and that's. Yeah, we, we can do this as an association. Not only do we have the only, the only cut of beef that'll make that qualifies for the American Heart Association. So if we could be the only association, and this, this would be self-governed if 
if, if you chose, I'm not picking on anybody, but if you chose to lie on, I'm gonna give them shots, that I'm still gonna have an affidavit, that's, that's between you and your customer. Okay, that, that has nothing to do with, <coughs> with the Texas Longhorns as a whole. But it's, it's another marketing opportunity that uh, I don't think we take, we take advantage of. Well, if you have a calf that's gotten sick and you actually gave it a shot of antibiotics when it was a calf, is, have you screwed up your antibiotics? If, if, you, go, if you go to the USDA uh, website, and, and it, it, it can be complicated going, finding a, a right answer, um, because I'm, I'm feeding grass fed, if, if, uh, if that animal ate a range cube, it's not contaminated. <coughs> it's not, what, what, what you're saying is, the animal, the animal hasn't been in a feed feed lot. You know, it, it's been it's been it's been ninety nine percent of its time on grass. There are shots that are acceptable. Um, free range chickens. You know, have you heard heard about them? Very very popular, very healthy. But <clears throat> if you read the how uh, how people market their 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 ration is mildly enhanced with other ingredients. Hmm. What did that just say? They, they, they started them on medicated chicken. Okay, so there's. I'm, I'm not going to give legal advice on what shots are uh, Laura's lean beef. Everybody familiar with them? They they she started a a business, lean beef business, and grew so fast that they they they, they hired partners. If you wanted to join her team, you had to sign an affidavit. And I'll, I'll do this and I promise to do that, whatever. Close. You, you, what happens when the green gets in there? You, you get some coyotes in there. And, and, and they, they've had, had some problems. And that goes back to uh, people giving shots, uh, things not exactly as they, they started out. Good intentions, but they didn't follow through. The advantage this group has got is um, uh, my boss, uh, the boss of JBR, and I are going too, so you know there's there's not there's not a lot of overhead and, and uh, uh, we don't have to worry about memos. She tells me what to do and I do it. Yeah. Um, anyway, the 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 product the, the products you want to do, uh, the, the hamburger, the hamburger simple. But when you do the hamburger, when I do the hamburger, I'm paying for all the deboning. I'm paying for all the grinding, I'm paying for all the packaging, and I'm, if I do a whole animal, a, a good steer, I have to have $4 a pound to hold my money together. But if I turn around and I take the steaks off, roast, roast the hamburger or a tray off. You still have to debone and you still have to grind, but I'm, all, I'm still getting the same price for it. So if I can sell a roast versus hamburger, I will. Anything I can sell, um, Hamburger is my last resort to put in the package and sell it. You were talking about grilling the hamburgers. We, we always did the one pound packages. They're, they're bricks, flash frozen. They stack, you put them in a the shell, display them. But if you wanna, if you wanna, uh, you wanna grill them, uh, sidewalk them or whatever, get the pre patty ones. They're in two, they're, every one is sliced the same. You pop them out, frozen or not, and you do that, you throw them on the grill, roll them over, every hamburger's the same. Your steaks, uh, if you do in your business plan, when you're, when you're uh, marketing, going to your customers, whatever, have them take a, a T-bone, a ribeye, a, one of your better steaks, and leave the, and about three quarter inch steak, I heard you guys talking about that before, have that center still a little bit froze. Can't, can't put your finger in it, throw that on your grill, and uh, put your Chicago steak seasoning or whatever, you won't eat a better steak anywhere. And that being froze keeps that moisture in there. Tell your customers that. Uh, if you have websites, if you're gonna develop that, do lots of cooking tips. People, people can ruin a good piece of meat by turning them on high and leaving it there. It's, you're not trying to brand it, you're just trying to grill it or whatever and eat it. Can you use that example of Oh. <clears throat> My, uh, uh, my new son-in-law, they, they, he's, he's uh, got a smoking business, catering, whatever, and, and he's good at it, successful. 
So I had the bright idea. I, I, I had a hind quarter done on a big steer, had a debone, shipped it to him, and had him put in the smoker. Ruined it. It was terrible. He, took, he put it on the regular temperature, and I, and I, I, I gave him free advice, but uh, he, he, he cooked it at, what, 300, 250 degrees, and what he would do for a big brisket or whatever. And and I, I love long run, that's all I eat, and it, it was terrible. Um, one, one other thing, uh, when you're on your marketing, think outside the box. How many, how many people have had beef bacon? I ask, <laughs> where the hell do you get bacon on a beef? Take the brisket off of a beef, have it, have it cured just like you would a bacon, and have it sliced, unbelievable. Um, brisket is easy to sell, but you can, you can take that $2.50, $3 pound brisket, and you can get six, seven dollars a pound just like that. <clears throat> First time we did it, I had two skeletons, I had an experiment, right? Put the regular bacon in there, put the beef bacon in here. They both got, uh, the skillets were cold, heated them up. I turned them both about the same time and, uh, you know, went about my business in the kitchen. All of a sudden I started to smell something. So I rolled the, the pork bacon and it was, just about right. Of course, you know, there's all kinds of fat there. I rolled the beef bacon and I burnt one side. It's, uh, it cooks that quick. Uh, it's very lean. You have hardly any grease, even being the brisket. 